So on to our first speaker, Jemima Montaro. Jemima is our current national and Oceanian women's 20 kilometre race walking champion. Last month, Jemima broke an 18 year record held by the wonderful Jane Savin with a time of 1 hour, 27 minutes and 34 seconds. So figure it out. If you walk out of here, walk to the MCG, do a lap of the MCG and walk back within an hour and a half, Jemima's got a partner um, to pace with. Jemima has claimed three consecutive national titles in the net end for the 20k walk. She has secured the gold medal at the 2018 Commonwealth Games, represented Australia at the Tokyo Olympics, where she came sixth in the final for the women's 20k walk. She balances her athletic career with her academic and community pursuits, where she's currently studying medicine after completing her science degree at the University of Melbourne and is passionate about encouraging people to move, eat well and connect in her role as an IOC Young Leader and Ambassador for Blue Earth Foundation. Please welcome Jemima Montana. to a room filled with energy like this. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So, I'm Jemima, I'm an Olympian in the sport of race walking, and I'm a Commonwealth Games gold medalist, a medical student, and a bit of a speaker. The three most common things I hear every day about race walking does it run in the family, as if it's a genetic disease? Uh, perhaps you could walk faster than I run from every middle-aged person who hasn't run since their middle school athletic style. And oh, maybe I'll get you to walk around and do my Christmas shopping for me, which is another strange ask. Uh, the walking stuff is what I do, but it's not necessarily who I am. I'm happiest when I'm cooking dinner for family or friends. I'm terrified of anything alive in the ocean. And I'm incredibly clumsy, so I'm actually going to take one step back from that before I fall over it. So tonight I'd just like to tell you a few stories around the two broad themes of persevering through challenges and sitting with discomfort, and how we can realise our goals based on what I've learned so far. So let's start with persevering through challenges. And the biggest challenge I find in an endurance sport is sitting with discomfort. So about a year ago, I pulled out of a national championship for the first time. We were about three k's away from the finish line, and I was actually out in front by about 100 metres. But I could not deal with the volume up here any longer. If we rewind a few hours earlier, I remember being really focused on my competitors, on outcomes, on times, on what people would think of me depending on that outcome. And I was also being quite judgmental whenever a negative thought came into my mind. I was relying on something called cognitive control strategies, where we think that any negative thought that comes into our mind needs to be knocked out of the way with a positive one, otherwise we feel uncomfortable. And that created a panicked feedback loop, which meant that it was not long between warming up, forgetting my race plan, and pulling out of the race. So I needed a brand new approach to prepare for the Tokyo Olympic Games, which was just a few months later. And I transitioned from that cognitive control strategy, where we try and only ever think positively and feel good, to cognitive expansion, which is a much more mindful approach that I highly recommend. So the challenges were plentiful, standing on the start line at the Tokyo Olympics. As many of you will know, it was postponed by a year because of the pandemic, which also meant that we didn't have any family or friends on the sidelines. It was 32 degrees, very, very humid. I was standing shoulder to shoulder with the best women in the world, my idols. We had 20,000 metres to walk in front of most of the world watching on TV. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I had to breathe in the pressure, accept 
the negative and the positive thoughts and make space for them to expand. And when they did come along, thoughts such as, oh my gosh, how much longer can I really stay with this lead pack? Do I belong here? Do I have the grit that it takes to sit with this discomfort? I used what's called urge surfing, where you imagine that unhelpful thought, that discomfort as a wave, and you just need to resist the urge to give into it, resist the urge to pull out of the race or give up, knowing that it will eventually wash over. I ended up crossing the line in sixth place, having been ranked 16th on paper, and it was a really exciting day. Where I learned the ability to sit with discomfort was from another story of the picture on the right hand side of the screen that alludes to that. So, my nana, who we lost about six months ago, was a Holocaust survivor, and that's her, one of her passports. We lost her just before the Olympic Games, and in the aftermath of her passing, I was getting to know the story a little more. And she was about 12 years old when the Holocaust began, her sister was 14, and they got each other through. They were yin and yang, her sister being the beacon of light, the optimist, and Nana, the more mellow, present, stoic. And in reading her story and other stories of survivors and trying to understand what led to a greater chance of survival and greater capacity to deal with discomfort, it seems that the optimists, or those who wanted to always feel good and feel positive, like I did in that initial race, were constantly let down and deflated and exhausted, and that led to a reduced chance of survival. But those who were stoic and present by the manner, who wasn't worried about Liberation Day, she was just trying to hopefully meet her dad at the end of the day at the gate to share the piece of bread that she found. They weren't handing over their happiness and ability to persevere to some arbitrary date, event, thing in the future, which robs us of our joy in the present and they had a much greater capacity to endure the challenges. So hopefully that gives you an idea about dealing with discomfort and persevering. And let's change tack now to realizing our goals. I think setting goals is a relatively fun and easy part that we can all do well, but realizing them is where very few succeed. To start off with, I'd like to say that it's quite individual, how we create the conditions for success of goals. And I like to use this Venn diagram, mind, body, environment, with outcome at the centre, to help me create the conditions for success of any goal. And I actually have to use it just a few days ago. So, as we've already said, I've just taken on board a new medical degree with my training for this year's Commonwealth Games and World Champs and life feels very challenging and packed at the moment. And just last Thursday, I had my first GP placement day, and I've never been very good with wrinkles or blood and guts, and it was a simple mole excision. I thought I'd be totally fine, but I didn't even last until the scalpel came out. The GP was just drawing this water around the mole, putting the local anesthetic in, and I completely started to paint. And then, again, the negative thought loop that started of, you don't belong here, you're silly to even try, what are you wasting your time doing, you're not cut out for this. I had a big cry and a meltdown, which was mostly the helpful part, but the next morning, to deal with that overwhelm and that challenge, I drew out my Venn diagram, which brings me back to self-awareness and continuing to create conditions for success. So I wrote down, okay, what mindsets that helpful and unhelpful am I finding myself in? What environments that are helpful or unhelpful am I putting myself in? And what physical states? And then translated that Venn diagram to an action list that made me feel much, much better. So start with self-awareness and start by creating the conditions for you. The next important thing when realizing goals is tapping into what motivates you. And this picture is from a recent race that happened in February. It was the World Championships trial in Adelaide. And the week or so before, I was talking to my sports psychologist about an intention, a goal for the race. And we had an interesting discussion about whether you're forwards or away motivated. And the easiest way I can explain this is with two prominent tennis stars. 
So perhaps the only thing they and their son and I have in common is this tendency towards fear-based or way-based motivation. It's something that she was quite vocal about last year. So when we're motivated by fear, it's about fear of what the clock's going to say, fear of our competitors, fear of what others will think of us, reliance on external reputation or confidence. And when you're fear motivated, you often find that you get to the end of the goal, you cross the finish line, you finish the game of tennis, and yes, you feel relieved that the stress and the fear is over, but you don't necessarily ever feel joy or happiness and your longevity in that sport, in that goal, is limited. On the flip side, think about Dylan Olcott. In his recent acceptance speech for Australian of the Year, he said that tennis accolades trophies are number 30 on his list of priorities. And what's up at number one is the pursuit of his values, of making space for people with disability in this world. He went on to lose that Australian Open game just days later. And I really don't think it would have mattered because win or lose, he was succeeding in his, for the pursuit of his value of making space for people with disability. So, thinking about trying to be more like Dylan, I approached this race, seeing it as merely a vehicle through which to explore my values. Values like the pursuit of mastery, challenging myself, staying in control of that mental dialogue. We got to the halfway point, and my coach yelled out, you're on pace for James Adler's national record. That immediately instilled a fear of failure. I went back to my old habits. I felt in the kit of my stomach like I was scared to try and fall short. I was scared of what others would think. I was scared of giving it a go. And as you can see in the picture, I was lucky to be walking in a group of young guys. And I voiced this concern to them. And one of the boys who was walking next to me said, hey, if you are feeling too overwhelmed by focusing on you and the time and the record, just focus on helping us get to the finish line as quickly as possible. And without knowing it, he had tapped into one of my core values of working in teams and helping others achieve core things. And it was incredible that shift from fear-based, away-based motivation to forwards or value-based motivation was a huge weight off my shoulders. The, pit, the feeling in the pit of my stomach vanished, the self-belief came in, and I broke that national record of Jane Savills by about 18 seconds, I think. And an incredible feeling, an incredible lesson about what motivates us and what's much more useful. So I often talk a lot about having support networks as another key thing to realise our goals. And another thing I learned before the Olympic Games is that it's one thing to have a support network and have feedback coming in. It's another to be open to that feedback. I'm someone who's, in general, not great with feedback. I often find it a personal attack because I've found it hard to disentangle feedback about what I'm doing from feedback about who I am. So, as the story goes, it was about a week before the Olympic Games. The Australian track and field team were in our COVID safe bubble in Cairns. And I decided to send my mum some footage of me race walking for her final critique and for context, she's a physio with Byron and interest, and so this is not weird. She, I was ready for her glowing feedback. I was a week away from realising one of my big childhood goals, and I was ready for her to blow my ego even higher. And her response to the video was, we need to talk, and I want to do it on Zoom so I can share my screen. I thought, oh God, what's she going to say? But we met and I was open to feedback because I've learned to take what I do seriously without taking myself too seriously. So I could see what she was talking about in the footage, we came up with a plan, we came up with some trigger words, and in the end it was really important because the world record holder in that Olympic race was pit lane for two minutes. Someone who was about to claim the bronze medal was disqualified and I got through unscathed in sixth place. So the takeaway, it's one thing to have a support network, it's another to be open to feedback, and what's helped me is to take what I do seriously without taking myself too seriously. I'll wrap it up by leaving you with this quote. 
So in the months after the Olympic Games, I experienced something that a lot of people might have heard of, the post-Olympic blues, post-Olympic depression. And it's something that I really didn't think I would be susceptible to. Firstly, because I'm quite an even-tempered person, and secondly, because the COVID Games weren't as incredible as the usual Olympics, and so I thought that that come down wouldn't be as great. But nonetheless, when you've dedicated 15 years of your life to preparing for something and then it's over, it was just a really strange few months. And I had this nat natural inclination to want to quickly move on, to swiftly set the next goal and not linger too long uh, in the aftermath. And despite being encouraged to just simmer and enjoy the slow moments, I find that really challenging. But I came across this quote and I'd like to leave it with you. The beauty in life lies in the space between the notes. This is something I'm still trying to work on, but I think it's a really great one because it shows us that it's awesome to dedicate our life to these different goals and the pursuit of them, but it's in the pauses along the journey, in daily gratitude practices, in celebrating the small wins, in discussing it over dinner with your inner sanctum. That's where you really extract the joy, that's what makes it all worthwhile, and that's what means that Win or lose, like what all what teaches us, if you're seeing what you do as a vehicle through which to pursue your values, the joy and happiness will be extracted. So thank you. Tracking your progress, and I'm sure you're going to wish you every success. We'll all be shouting at the screen, and we'll see you looking at 20k. So, thank you so much.